What's up, everyone? Welcome to another episode of Become a Local Leader. My name is Grant Finley Shears, and on today's show, we have a branding mastermind. So if you want your customers to feel like they're cheating on you if they were to choose one of your competitors, then keep listening and watching because we have the CEO and founder of Soul Marketing. She's a global keynote speaker and also author of the best-selling books, Branding is Sex, Get Your Customers Laid and Sell the Hell Out of Everything, or anything, and Irrational Loyalty, Building a Brand that Thrives in Turbulent Times, which we might be getting into. She's also the founder of Investor Pitches, so for all you startups out there listening who want to raise money and you know, you're an engineer by trade, you could build your own investor pitch or you could have an expert do it for you, which you may want to do that. All right, so this marketing maven, she was born to brand and we're gonna pick her brain on how to do it. So get ready and let's get to know and learn from Miss Deb Gabor. Hi. Thanks so much, Deb, for being on the show. Thank you. So when I was reading your profile and looking at the books and came across Branding as Sex, which I thought it was an ingenious name, I kind of want to get into there right away, but I'm gonna leave it because I think everyone kind of needs to hear first your story, how you got into branding. like. Branding is a niche. Not everyone gets into that specialty. How did you find it? And why did you wanna you know, become an expert in the space? So you were explaining at the beginning that I was born to brand. It really was kind of a compulsion and it was manifest destiny that I ended up in branding. So um, I grew up in the technology industry actually. Okay. So for about the first 10 years of my career, I worked at technology companies, working in product marketing and marketing communications roles and um, it touched branding lightly, and about you know the middle of my career there, one of the tech companies that I worked for actually started turning product marketers into brand managers, and I had had a background in marketing and communications and things like that, but had never really been exposed to brand, and so I kind of I. I became an autodidact on branding mm -hmm. and learned as much as I could about it and really helped transform the organization that I was working with into a brand focused organization. So that's really where it started. Um, but my obsession for branding took off when I left the in-house side of the business and working for these big technology companies and I went and started working at a couple of agencies. So one of the first agencies that I went to work for was a it was a market research focused brand consulting firm and they brought people from industry who could speak the language mm -hmm. of the customers and who really understood the market rather than being people who just understood market research and brand strategy. And I learned brand strategy from being kind of on the inside of this consulting firm. And then from there, you know, started to develop my own methodologies for this and putting them to work. And then uh, I'm an accidental entrepreneur. I ended up starting my own company back in 2003 when I only had like two nickels to rub together. Yeah. Um, I make a terrible employee. So it, you know, when I say that I'm an accidental entrepreneur, um, there was just really no company that could contain me because I had so many ideas and methodologies and things that I yeah. had done and wanted to do. So I ended up starting my own company and it's just sort of taken off ever since. So that's kind of my story. I never, I never set out to be an entrepreneur. I never set out to build a company. I think originally I wanted to do some consulting and hang a mm -hmm. shingle and charge by the hour. And what I was doing was so valuable to clients and they were really enjoying the insights that they were able to get and how it transformed their business that uh, more and more clients kept coming and then I had to hire helpers and then I woke up one morning and I'm like, oh my gosh, I have a company. So that's kind of how that worked. And then the rest is, as they say, history. Now, when you work for companies, you know, the goal at the end of the day for a company is to grow. It's to grow yeah. revenue, to grow profits. Yep. And some people think like branding is wishy-washy, but yet you're really into it. You're really excited about it. And you think it's, the, it's, the, it's one of the big answers to solve for a company. Like what excites you most about branding. Well, you hit the nail on the head when you said that branding really is something about growth, right? So a lot of people, when I ask them to tell me what their perspective of branding is, they say they think that branding is a logo or it's a color scheme or it's a campaign. It's kind of the visual identity and the look and the mm -hmm. feel of the organization. And branding is so much more. And what excites me about branding is that it's a strategic activity that you can do in your business that gives you relentless focus that helps you grow. Um, it's a strategic exercise 
eyes and it's about creating that condition of irrational loyalty. We all, regardless of what kind of business we're in, whether we're serving other companies or we're serving consumers, we want to create a condition in which our customers are so bonded to us that they'd feel like they were cheating on us if they were to choose one of your competitors or choose an alternative. Yeah. And that's what I mean by irrational loyalty and it's a strategic activity which goes down to defining the core DNA of the organization. So how does the organization show up? What does it say about a person that they use the brand? You know, how do they help that person elevate their self-concept? So just in the way that I know, I know a little bit about you, this is my first time meeting you, but I know a little bit about you from the fact that you chose this fabulous suite in the Aria Hotel to be able to do this interview, that you're dressed the way that you are, that you're wearing the shoes that you are, right? Yep. So every brand that you buy, what you eat, what you drink, what you wear, what you drive, the other businesses that you hire to help you grow in your own business all say something about you as a person. And so branding is the act of tapping into that uniqueness. So I always tell people, brands don't compete to be different, they compete to be unique. And that's why people buy you is for the uniqueness okay. of you and your business. So you brought it up, so I have to dig into it. What yes. does it say about me that I did this? That so I look it, at this and yeah, have this room? Yeah, so what it says about you, you know, I was really excited getting prepared for this interview and that you were gonna be in one of the Sky Suites because I'm over in the cheap seats on the other side of the hotel. But it says about you that you value your interview subjects, right? Mm -hmm. And also you value the subject matter. You wanna choose an environment that adds to and doesn't detract from the experience of people looking at and, and taking in the interview content, right? Um, it says about you that you are confident and that you've got some swagger yourself and that, you know, that this is actually a premium experience that I'm having and therefore your viewers, your listeners, they're mm -hmm. going to have a similar experience. So um, if you had chosen to conduct this by the pool, like while the ns, ns, ns music is going <laughs> on outside, right? Like that would yeah. create a completely different vibe, yeah. right? So this says that you're credible. It also says that you value your audience, that your audience is sophisticated, that you mm -hmm. are sophisticated. Mm -hmm. So these are all those things. Like, I don't know anything about yeah, you, but yeah, those yeah. are the big takeaways, right? I loved when I, when I did the research, I loved that, what does it say about you when you, like we work with lots of realtors, what does it yep. say about you when you do print? What does it say about you when you do buying leads off Zillow and Realtor.com? Yep. What does it say about you when you drive this car versus that car? What does it say about you? I love, because um, one of the definitions I had for branding, I'll ask you your definition for it was, what are the things that people think and say about you when they hear and see your name? It is that um, and more. So I always describe branding as a construct that has two parts. Like if you think about the yin and the yang. So the yin part mm -hmm. here, this is the core. This is your brand identity. This is the part that you own. And then around it is, you know, kind of the yang part. And the yang part is the part that everybody else owns. And those two things need to match. Mm -hmm. So your brand identity and your brand image need to match. So it's the sum total of those things. So when your brand identity and your brand image match, then you have a solid and, and firm kind of deliverable brand promise. When the brand identity and the brand image don't match, that's where you get into trouble, right? So we see brands showing up today behaving in a way that doesn't seem like it's in accordance with the brand. Let's talk about the Aria Resort, for instance, right? Mm -hmm. So we're here at the resort. I've had a really great premium sort of white glove experience. However, when I walked through the door to check in on Saturday afternoon, the line to check in, regardless of whether you were checking in at VIP check-in or you were checking in at regular regular check-in was like around the queues, right? It didn't seem very magical. Mm -hmm. It didn't seem very high touch. It didn't seem very white glove. The mobile check-in stands were not working, which is sort of a premium experience mm -hmm. that I would expect, right? Not to bag on the on the Aria, but that's where the brand image and the brand identity don't match. Aria is trying to project to the rest of the world that, you know, we are a premium uh, hospitality brand in Las Vegas. You know, yeah. we're in sort of an area, there are a lot of high-end properties right in this area where you've come to have a sort of uh, a particular expectation of that. When something happens that doesn't match what our expectation is, you have a broken brand promise. United Airlines, when they drag that guy off the airplane, right? Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. United's stated brand promise is to be the most caring airline in the world. If you're the most caring airline in the world, you don't pull somebody physically yeah. out of their seat, yeah. right? Yeah. So that's why it's what you say and more. And so you have a brand, whether you like it or not, you have to take control of it and you have to dial in that brand identity and make sure it matches the expectations that people have of you so that you don't end up with the broken brand promise. Cool. All right, now you work with companies and 
there are people in the organization who have a role, they have a title, and they think that this is what they do, and they probably lack an awareness or an understanding uh, priority around brand that mm -hmm. maybe you think if you're in these roles in the company, you need to be more aware and understanding of branding and how it works. Sure. What have you found? So um, most of my clients, especially the, the emerging brands and kind of the mid-cap growth companies that have a lot at stake to, to grow, like people with a grow or die mindset, it's the CEO who approaches us, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I always say, and I've written about this in both of my books, I always say that branding is everyone's responsibility in the organization. It starts from the top, but it's owned by every single person. So it's don't leave it just up to the marketing person in your organization or the person who, who's in charge of customer experience. Branding really belongs to everybody and the people at the top are the ones who ultimately have to drive that. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you're not credible, right? You're not credible, you're not believable, you're not authentic. So it needs to be owned by everybody. And I tell people this all the time, there's no other function in a business where you get more unnecessary, unhelpful input than in marketing, right? There's nobody who goes to the accounting department and says, hey, I think you should add these numbers like this. Yeah. But you know, everybody has an opinion about marketing, yeah. don't they? They're like, yeah. oh, we should get these shirts and we should get these tote bags and we should we should put these things on our cars, right? Yeah. And like, you should do or a campaign like, like this. that. We should try this messaging for Yes, the exactly. Yeah. Why don't we say, right? Yeah. Um, so, so it's really hard. Um, that's why it's really important that it's driven from the top of the organization. Okay and that everyone is indoctrinated to it, everybody is bought into it. Um, I've never done a significant branding exercise where there hasn't been what I call bloodshed. Um, so if you're doing it right, it hurts a little bit because branding is more about what you choose not to do mm -hmm. than it is about what you choose to do. Okay. Because if you were the person who's sitting there being the unfortunate recipient of all shit rolling downhill in marketing, you know, and taking everybody's mm -hmm. input, you'd be doing everything and you wouldn't be having, you know, a focused, consistent, you know, just sort of laser sharp kind of impact on growing the brand. So what are some things that the top management can do to drive the brand? And then what are some of the things that the people also can do to continue the brand message forward through the customer interactions they have? I think about first, like what are some of the best brands in the world and what do they do? So the best brands in the world are the ones that communicate from a place of purpose and passion and from, um, from their core DNA, like why they do what they do and who they are for and what they believe. And the people at the top can kind of convey, like these are our values and beliefs as an organization and here's how we're gonna use those as a magnet to attract to us the right kinds of employees, the right kinds of clients and customers, mm -hmm. the right kinds of partners and service providers who help us really deliver on that vision that we have. So the most important thing that leadership can do in an organization is set the tone and direction by expressing both what that vision is and then what those core values and beliefs are as an organization and how they're gonna make their customer a hero in their own story. Mm -hmm. That's the most important thing that management can do or leadership can do in an organization. And then also, even if they're not working on the brand strategy and the brand exercise directly, they need to be part of it. They need to own it, they need to drive it, they need to be responsible for it, and they need to say, hey, everybody, you need to get in line with this. And then everybody else throughout the, the rest of the organization, their main job is to deliver on that promise, the vision, the mission, the values of that brand with every action. So when we see brands behaving in an inconsistent way, it often is because there's one person in one place um, you know, for real estate, think about it this way. Uh, I live in Austin, Texas, and so Keller Williams has a huge, huge presence mm -hmm, there. Mm -hmm. I have a certain expectation of how a Keller Williams agent is going to show up and how they're going to behave in any interaction I have with them. If one loan agent, and this is like completely hypothetical, I've not had this experience, but if one loan agent who comes, like let's say I'm selling my home and I'm, and I'm taking, you know, I'm interviewing agents to list my home and I have an agent come into my house who behaves in a way that that doesn't meet the expectation of what I've come to expect as the leadership footprint of that organization mm -hmm. I'm gonna have some dissonance. I'm gonna have some cognitive dissonance. I'm gonna be uncomfortable. I'm going to take that experience that one single experience and that might reflect on my entire impression of the whole brand
right? Got it. And so every single person in the organization needs to understand what are our values as an organization, what are our beliefs, what is our mission, you know, what are the self-expressive benefits of the brand, what do we want it to say about our clients that they use this brand, and then deliver on that promise every single day. So going back to that United Airlines example, that gate agent who started the whole thing where that doctor got pulled off an airplane on his way back to Louisville after a mm -hmm. busy week of business travel, um, she didn't mean to start a revolution. You know, it wasn't her intention. She thought she was doing the right thing, but it all comes down to a culture that wasn't directly intertwined with the brand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, you talked about some cool methods and ideas that you have around this yeah. that people can contain. You've worked with some really cool clients, mm -hmm. um, Tucker Max, Dell, University of Texas. Like, it's a really wide range of industries. Um, can you talk about maybe one or two projects that stand out in terms of like, this is the goal, this is what the before situation was like, this is some of the methodologies and ideas that we implemented, yep. and here's what happened after. Yeah, so um, one, one of my favorite clients that I've ever worked with, and I don't work with them anymore, gosh, this goes back, uh, I think almost a decade, this company called All Recipes, okay. and they're an online destination for food content, basically a recipe website. Mm -hmm. And when we first started working with them, this is where food content was really starting to grow online. And the big players in the space were like Epicurious and um, Google was starting to be like a real competitor in the food space in that you could enter, and you can still do this, you can enter in a couple of ingredients or the name of a recipe, and you can get anywhere, you know, you can get 500, 600 recipes that would pop up that contain those ingredients or have that recipe name in them. And so All Recipes was really trying to figure out, you know, how do we compete, how do we grow? They had been owned previously by uh, another company and then were purchased by Reader's Digest Corporation, which this is, this is how long this goes back, but they were purchase for like $65 million, which at the time was a pretty big purchase in the internet space. And they were really trying to figure out how do we differentiate, how do we carve out a unique role for ourselves in this increasingly crowded space of online recipe databases, basically. Mm -hmm. And you know what we determined through our work by going out and actually talking to home cooks. I went into people's homes and I watched them cook at the dinner hour. You know what was going on in their homes while they were cooking. Who was there? Their kids are sitting there doing homework. You know the the husband or wife is coming home from work, and you know there, there's conversation going on. It's this wild. It's this wild experience that's all taking place that isn't focused exactly on the food. One of the expectations that All Recipes had when, they, when we started with them was that every single person who identifies as a home cook cooks every single thing from scratch. And one of the big insights that we got from going into people's homes and watching mm -hmm. them cook dinner and doing lots of quantitative and qualitative research was the definition of home cooking spans everything from, I'm standing in front of the stove and it's on, to you know, cooking a full sort of like Thanksgiving quality meal, right? And so knowing that, it opened up a lot of new conceptual and financial territory for them in that they could, they were previously only selling advertising to ingredient brands like flour mm -hmm. and sugar and raw vegetables and the meat council and, and milk and things like that. And what they learned was that that their expectation was that home cooks cook everything from scratch. What they learned was home cooks on a regular night might cook one thing from scratch, but then everything else might be a salad that you open the bag and you pour it mm -hmm, in a bowl, mm -hmm. or you open a box of rice with some flavoring in it and you uh -huh, boil it on the uh -huh. stove, you know, these kinds of things. And so they were able to sell advertising to different types of brands to oh, be adjacent cool. to their content. And it helped the brand grow very rapidly because they figured out that their role was not to give people a badge of honor for cooking something that has 30 ingredients, but to help people answer the question of, what's for dinner Wednesday night, right? Mm -hmm. The brand grew exponentially in a very, very short period of time, I think five or six years, they were able to triple their revenues, they were able to expand to like 20 new countries, 17 new languages, and then they were purchased for like three times the original value by a larger publishing company who took the brand then even more global. So I love these kinds of stories, and the reason why I like that is that 
it wasn't about the logo, it wasn't about the look and feel, it really was about the strategy. It was the strategy of differentiating and defining. We are about answering the question of what's for dinner Wednesday night and by getting those insights of knowing how people really interact with the content, how people cook, how people live, how people mm -hmm. shop, all of these things, they were able to open up new financial territory. So I heard, you know, and, and it's, it's smart, like talk to your customers, talk to your prospects, talk yeah. to people who are your customers, talk yeah. to people who didn't become your customers, talk to people who are potentially becoming your customers, and not just talk to them, but like try to watch them, watch what they do, because yes. then they say something different than what they actually do, um, and all this research takes time. It takes a lot of time, and sometimes it's expensive. So how, what should companies be thinking about the process, and how long should this thing take before you can actually start yielding some insights and conclusions to then take some action on? So, you know, taking a small company, like let's take a small entrepreneurial venture of some kind, you yep. can be doing this research like while you're building, right? I, you know, um, this is the idea, sort of like the, the lean methodology, right? Mm -hmm. Where you're incorporating, you're incorporating feedback into the development of your product or your service or whatever. Um, I say don't go to market without doing any kind of discovery and it doesn't have to be formal research. You can do mother-in-law research. You can do like, I've even done, you know, sort of skunk works projects where we wanted to get some insight about um, how do people use online vacation rental websites and you know it's really easy to pull together very informally informal discussion groups where you bring people in you do like a little focus group you feed them some wine and pizza and then you send them along your way any insight is good insight right mm -hmm. and what I do advise is when you are out there talking to current customers, lost customers, potential customers, employees, partners, uh, influencers, media, when you're out there, you need to make sure that you're asking the right kinds of questions. That's really the key because we have a tendency to go out there and say, look at my thing, how do you like my thing? What's the right question? So the right questions, I, if you do nothing else in branding, you can ask my three brand swagger questions, Love like it. the magical Listen questions. Me. Like the first question is, what does it say about you that mm -hmm. you use this product? What does it say about you that you drive this car? What does it say about you that you wear this suit? What does it say about you that you hire this mm -hmm. company, mm -hmm. right? We have a tendency to wanna ask people, like what do you like about me? This is a different way of asking that question that puts the customer in the center of the conversation. What does it say about you? Or if you're talking about a prospective customer, you can talk to them a little bit about how do you make your decision? What's important to you when you are making a choice to buy a whatever, right? What attributes are most important to you? What do you want it to say about you when you make a choice? Right? Mm -hmm. So that's the first question. The second question, which is the hardest one to answer, and the one that I recommend if you're gonna spend any time, spend time on this one, that's the question of what's the one thing that you get from me that you can't get from anyone else? So when you think about it, uh, a lot of the things that we buy and the decisions that we make, the functional benefits of those things do not differ, right? Mm -hmm. Like you could buy the jacket that you're wearing, you could buy any number, like probably when you went to buy that jacket, you had 400 choices, right? But you chose that particular one. There were many, many other jackets that could cover your body, that could you know, fit you, appropriately mm -hmm. that have mm -hmm. you know a fine fabric that they're made of they have a good lining they have french seams etc right mm -hmm. those kinds of things the features the bells and whistles are not what differentiates it right mm -hmm. what differentiates something at the end of the day is its uniqueness and its singularity what's the one thing that you get from that that you can't get from anything else right mm -hmm. i think about I think about automobiles a lot. I'm old enough to have purchased a car where power door locks and power windows were not standard equipment. It was an option that we paid we paid extra for. In fact, I remember the very first car that I purchased, the salesman showed me the vanity mirror and he was like, hey, look at this, you want one of those? That's $400 extra, right? But then yeah. some smart car manufacturer started making all of that stuff standard equipment and it became standard equipment for the industry. So my advice is if you're out there marketing on the basis of some kind of feature or a bell or a whistle or uh, for instance you're a car manufacturer that's marketing yourself on the basis of of a self-parking feature someone else can imitate that if someone else can imitate it they will right and so that's not a sustainable differentiator so what's okay. the one thing that people get from you that they can't get from anyone else okay. 
So I'm in Austin, Texas. There are 150 other people who say they do the same thing that I do. The one thing that people come to me for is to get a big kick in the ass, right? You know, they get sort of a strategic kick in the ass that they otherwise yeah. wouldn't get. I don't take any clients who say, I just need a, right? They say, I just need a website. I just need a logo. Yeah. I'm like, no, unless you're willing to do the hard work and get pushed, I'm not the right fit. So put a velvet cool. rope around what you do and screen out as much as yeah. you do screening in. And then the third question, which is the sex question, question is how do you make your customer a hero in their own story? I said, your brand is about them. It's mm -hmm. not about you. And so you think about what's the narrative that somebody is trying to create for their lives. Real estate, especially the homes that people buy are part of connecting together these important milestones of their lives. Whenever anybody moves to a new home, it's usually not on whim. It's because there's some kind of important milestone. I got married, I got divorced, uh, I just got an assignment in a new city, I'm starting a family, uh, I just had a financial windfall. These are important life milestones. Don't forget about those things because the act of real estate is part of chaining those things together, mm -hmm. but also a person's home and, and where they live is part of the person that they are, right? And so if you think about what is the story that this person is trying to tell about themselves, what is the role that the home plays for them, but more importantly, what is the role that say the real estate agent or the brokerage plays in helping them tell that story? Uh, if you're selling a product, if you're selling real estate technology, for instance, you know, what does it say about the person that's buying this and how they want to be perceived in the world and the story that they're trying, not only to tell other people, but what they tell themselves. Yeah. If you're in sales and marketing and you didn't get a lot out of what she just said, then you weren't listening. I right. love, like even the question of, in, in a sales process, it's really common to say, um, you book a demo and you're like, hey, so you know, what did you like about what you just heard? It's a very mm. common question. Ouch. Which, it, it's, it's a way better way of saying is, what does it say about you if you were to do this? Or what's the one thing that you think you could get from us you can't get from anywhere else? Yeah, way better questions similar it's like yeah. and, and so a salesperson not deviating from like the purpose of that which is to get a person to show you that they listened to what you said so far they actually yeah. are interested they can even comprehend how they're interested but those are way better questions because the person's identity is a huge reason why they do or don't do something. Right, right. And, and so, you know, what, whatever product that them. is, also yeah. think about like who is the ideal customer for that product. Mm -hmm. You know, create a picture in your mind of who's the customer who is most highly predictive of, of success for whatever product that is. Let's say it's a technology product, right? Mm -hmm. And people often forget that when you're selling a technology product, they think that they're selling to a procurement organization and they're selling to like some nameless, face faceless mm -hmm. automaton. Mm -hmm. Like there are human beings behind those purchases. And if they're, they're an individual that's purchasing that for their business, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, when you think about like, what's the story that you're trying to tell? Like, what do you want to show your customers? Um, do you want to show your customers that you're innovative? Do you want to show them that your customer intimate? Do you want to show them that mm. you are the the fastest growing, um, highest producing for the most discerning customers agency in the area, right? Mm -hmm. And then you can ask them, how does this fit into that for you? Rather than what did what do you like about what you just saw? Yeah. Like that's such a salesy question. I know. <laughs> Versus being really consultative and surfacing a little bit of pain. Yeah. Right? Like using the neuroscience of it and say, like, yeah. tell me a little bit about what some of the challenges are that you're dealing with. And you're like, okay, I hear you, I hear you. I always switch to, you know, I, I do like a 30 second commercial almost to say, like, okay, so you said this, 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 this. Well, you know, we are, uh, here's a vision for what the world looks like when that pain is removed very, very quickly. And then I jump into like, your situation reminds me a little bit of this client that we worked with. They were struggling with this, this, and this. Do any of those things resonate with you? And they're like, yeah, right? Yeah. Then you can go right in and you can kind of, you know, you can talk about it in the context of whatever pain they're yep. feeling. Yep. And then when you get to that place where where they start to lean forward and engage with you yep. and they start to show those buying signs without ever having to ask the question of what do you like about what you just saw, yep. you know, you can ask them a little bit like, okay, so you said earlier that you you want to be seen as as the most innovative whatever in your in your geographical area. Um, you also said that these are some of those pains you know, how is this going to make you look like a hero? 
Or mm -hmm. what's the one thing you think you can get from this that you haven't seen yet anyplace else? So there's yeah. a way to use these in sales, in research, in, in marketing, in messaging. Like that's your whole, that's your yeah. whole marketing message right there is the answer to those questions. How did you come up with the name Branding is Sex for a book? Where does this come from? Yeah, you know, my parents are so proud of me because, you know, <laughs> I, wrote a, I wrote a book that has both words sex and laid in the title. Um, yeah. So I, I told you I grew up in technology companies. I grew up in technology companies and then, you know, my first few agency jobs, I was in agencies that were serving these fast-growing tech companies like back in the go-go days of the tech industry. So, you know, high, high, high growth. A lot of organizations run by great engineering and software minds and very scientifically mm -hmm. quantitatively oriented people as you can imagine all of these squishy questions about what does it say about a person and what's the one thing they get from us and who's your ideal customer like it it, it wasn't going over really well yeah. and so in a bit of frustration when i was sitting in front of a, a ceo who is now very 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 famous um, sitting in front of, of him and like I was not getting through, I kind of said, okay, at the end of the day, how does this technology product get that IT guy laid? And he was like, oh, all right, I've got it, right? And so just the, the opportunity to open up that kind of conceptual territory. So I have my three brain questions. I have the ideal customer archetype. I have all yeah. these different methodologies. If you forget all of these things and you want to just go to the shortcut for, you know, what is a brand and what is my brand about, just ask yourself, like, how do I get my customer or my client laid? Right? If you really think about that, yeah. because, you know, that's the hero that's question. Cool. So that's yeah. where that came from. I love it. Now, some people, let's, let's talk about real estate agents because they, and, and professionals, for instance, they, they almost wonder like, what is their brand? And they're trying to figure it out. Mm -hmm. So what are some of your tactics to help a person figure out what their brand is or should be? Yeah. Which are two different things, I know. But. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, what you're, you have a brand whether you like it or not. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so I recommend if you, if you really want to experience some opportunity from branding, the first thing that you need to do is actually go out and ask people what their perceptions of you are. Mm -hmm. I recommend having a third party do that because, um, you know, for the, for the same reason that, that I don't recommend that you ask people, so what do you like about my thing? People don't want to hurt your feelings, yeah, right? Yeah, so if you get yeah. an independent third party to do that and just sort of say like, hey, you know, what what uh, what have you enjoyed about working with Grant? What are, uh, uh, what does it say about you that you work with him? What's the one benefit that you get from working with him that you don't get from anywhere else? When you're making a decision about buying X, what are the attributes that you're considering? Who do you mm -hmm. think has the most momentum in the industry and why? What do you wish that you could be able to do that you can't do those kinds of things? So like gather that, that research so that you have a real bead on what your actual brand is from the perspective of the outside. So that's kind of the first step. And then the second step is really to understand what's inside of you. You know, like what are you authentic and credible in delivering against those expectations. Most of the time, you know, when my firm goes out and does these branding exercises, most of the time we find that the perceptions of the outside don't always match the perceptions of the inside and you have to sort of reconcile that. And so understanding like what does the what does the outside world expect from you and need from you and want from you and what are you capable of delivering as a promise and marrying those two things together mm -hmm. is really important for defining the brand. So for a real estate agent it's probably a small skunk works kind of project and and you can get some help you can even hire a summer intern or find a college student yeah. to actually conduct this third party research for you so that you can get a perspective on that because the essence of branding it really is a strategic exercise where you want to know what does the market want and need and expect of me and how do i authentically incredibly deliver on that thing and that's really the whole thing very cool all right I got some lightning round questions. Okay. Say what comes to your mind when you when you hear this. <laughs> your top three favorite brands. Um, I'm obsessed with Bluebell Ice Cream, which is a little brand from Texas. Yeah. Irrationally loyal. They killed three of their customers, yet uh, customers keep coming back. And it's not premium ice cream. It's just ice cream, but it has a lot of nostalgia. Uh, second brand I'm obsessed with. 
My latest obsession is Chanel. Okay. Like that is a brand, like they've had their ups and downs. It's a luxury brand, but it's very, very clear. They have a very clear and distinctive point of view. And um, it really sends a very strong message to other people what I'm about when I use and wear their products. Mm -hmm. And then um, a third brand that I am obsessed with, I hate to say it, Apple. I'm irrationally loyal to all eye thingies. Mm -hmm. Like really irrationally yeah. loyal, yeah. Top three, your favorite business books. Uh, well, two of them were written by me. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say that. Um, so yeah, uh, top three business books. Okay, classic book, The Discipline of Market Leaders by Michael Tracy. It's okay. an oldie but a goodie. The examples are a little bit outdated, um, but the theory behind it is good. Good to Great by Jim Collins. And you know the the sister or brother publication that goes with that is built to last. Mm -hmm. um, again, oldies but goodies, but I think they're like a really really solid foundation. Um, and um, this is a really good one that I've recently become obsessed with, and I can't remember the name of the guy who wrote it. It's called Your Oxygen Mask First. Mm. And what this book is about, it's for leaders, right? And it's about. Um, sort of your own authentic leadership and sort of taking care of yourself as a leader. Uh, it, it's, it's a surprising book. One of the things that I really like about it, there's like the book book and then there's a workbook. I got the workbook and I've been working through the exercises and it's given me a lot of clarity and it's really sort of helped me set my vision for my company for the next couple of years and how I'm growing my own personal brand and a couple of other side businesses. What is the vision for your company? Your brand? So I, I've been running Soul Marketing since 2003. Um, I've had a lot of success off of these books and you know I travel all over the world uh, doing public speaking and running workshops and things like that. I In my company, I get to serve really, really big brands, some of the, the biggest brands in the world. Um, and then I write books and you know anybody can buy them. There's this whole world in between of individuals with personal brands, people with small companies, small businesses, uh, nonprofit organizations who can benefit from the voodoo that I do that I want to serve by building a whole set of consulting products and content yeah. that is specifically targeted at them. So um, I'm looking to build up you know, elevate the people in my core company so that, you know, in a couple of years, other people can take over the running of that. And then I can really work on these things that I'm really passionate about. I do miss like a lot of the hands-on aspect of yeah. doing the work of branding, being a CEO and, and being the face of the company. And then also like being out there and doing my own thing. I'm, I'm, not hands-on in branding as much as I want to be. So that's the vision for my company is to keep scaling the core company yeah. and, and you know hiring and retaining the dream team so that they can run with it. And, and I know I'm getting there because I had a day last week that I wasn't supposed to be in the office and I showed up in the office and I was like, oh great, I can get some work done and I didn't have anything to do. I have all these amazing people working around me who are taking that's care great. of things. So that's the vision. How can people get in touch with you if they want to get to know you or connect with you and maybe talk to you about something? I think the easiest way to get in touch with me is like to shoot me an email. It's super easy. It's deb at debgabor.com. I also have a website that has like information about the books and my workshops and online video masterclass that people can sign up for, uh, coaching services, all that kind of stuff. And that's debgabor.com. Yep. If you're interested in my company, that's called Soul Marketing, but I can get in touch with them if you want to get in touch with me. Cool. Uh, that's it for today's show. We could probably talk about marketing and branding forever. I had a whole bunch of stuff we didn't even get to um, because this lady has lots of great content. Uh, I know lots of marketers and branding people and already I've already got lots of nuggets that I have not really heard before. So check out more of her content, reach out to her. And as always, if you haven't subscribed to the YouTube show and the podcast, do it so you can get to know more leaders in business, in marketing, in real estate, so you can have more success in your life and your business. Thanks so much and we'll see you next time.